Hi, I'm Peter Adamson, and you're listening to the History of Philosophy podcast, brought to you with the support of King's College London and the Leverhulme Trust. Today's episode will be an interview with my colleague here at King's, Rafael Wolf. Thanks for coming, Rafael, to talk on the podcast. Very good to be here, Peter. Thank you. Our topic today is Socrates, and I thought that we could probably concentrate on Socrates as he's presented in Plato, since that'll give us plenty to talk about. So I was wondering whether you could start by sort of describing how Socrates appears in Plato's dialogues. Sure. Um, he's a complicated figure, um, but I think the, the way that, that he's probably best characterized is the way he characterizes himself in the Apology. He's a, he's, a, he's a gadfly. There's a famous image in the Apology where he compares himself to a gadfly who's coming and sitting on the um, large but lazy horse of Athens um, and buzzing and biting and stinging to provoke it into um, living a better life. And I think a lot of that imagery can be seen in the way that Plato portrays Socrates in many of the dialogues. Uh, Probably the, the main but not the only way he's presented is going around buttonholing people asking them if they can tell him what various virtues are because Socrates, who doesn't? Socrates wants to know how to be virtuous and he thinks that there are various people who might just, with a bit of luck, be able to tell him. Um, He asks them what virtue is and they are unable to tell him by and large and the reason they're unable to tell him is that when they attempt to tell Socrates what virtue is, he asks them a whole series of questions which um, seek to demonstrate that they don't know what they're talking about. So Socrates is by and large portrayed by Plato as a very annoying figure who is constantly showing people up for an ignorance which they didn't think they possessed or at least don't like having revealed because these are by and large public contexts, there are often people around. Um, So he's an annoying, provocative figure um, who really is trying, I think, pretty much to carry out the mission he describes in the Apology. And I think it's important that he is shown as this annoying figure. I think maybe this is something we can talk about, but he's not at all sanitized by Plato. I think most fair-minded readers get the impression that this would be a pretty difficult person to deal with. The kind of person you'd cross the street to avoid. Absolutely, yes. And I think a few of his interlocutors might have wished they'd done that. But uh, yeah. And is it your impression that Plato's portrayal of Socrates is closely based on the historical Socrates? I mean, this is one of the big questions this is, about this is one of the, This is one of the big questions. I, I suppose to the extent, I mean, if you compare it, I mean, Aristophanes, we've got the three sort of main bits of evidence um, for Socrates. Unfortunately, Um, As is well known, Socrates himself did not write anything, and that's why you get this so-called problem of Socrates. Who was this guy? He doesn't tell us because he didn't leave any writings behind. So we have Plato, Xenophon, and Aristophanes. Aristophanes is a comic poet, so you've got, although he was the the closest contemporary, so in principle his is the, the sort of best evidence we have. But it's a satire, it's a parody, and it's very difficult for us at this distance of time to unwind from that and get to the the real Socrates. And then you have Plato and Xenophon, who are both followers of Socrates to some extent. And Plato's Socrates is, as I say, a very provocative, um, annoying figure. Xenophon's Socrates is much duller. And (laughs) I say... I, I'm going. I mean, I'm a little biased in this, but I, I am going to give Plato the sort of uh, the plaudits for perhaps coming closest to representing the real Socrates for the following reason: that I think again, any fair-minded person who reads Plato's portrayal can see why this guy might have been executed for causing trouble. Those weren't the official charges, but that's what it amounts to. If you read Xenophon it's much harder to see why anybody would have worried about this figure being dangerous enough to put on trial for corrupting the young. Because he sometimes seems more like a slightly sarcastic agony aunt or something like that. Yes, exactly, exactly. And, and you know, nobody's you know, going to make a big deal about, about that. I think one thing I'd like to add, though, that's important here, um, in a way, it, it sort of 
opens up the question again. You know, we've we've awarded Plato the gold medal for sort of accurate portrayal, but I think there's an important qualification because I don't want to I don't want to sort of leave Xenophon sort of too far behind, because it seems to me that one thing that's as clear as anything could be about Socrates is that he was a very good teacher, particularly for, I mean, I think he adopted a rather different attitude to people who weren't sort of in his circle and to people who had pretensions to knowledge, but people who sort of followed him, I think like any good teacher, he was different depending on who he had in front of him. And Plato was obviously a very brilliant guy. And Xenophon... (laughs) Tend to say obviously wasn't. Um, I love Xenophon, by the way. I, I, he I had other pretty, gifts. He had other gifts, as they say. And I think it's very natural that Socrates should be at his most provocative when dealing with a sort of budding genius like Plato, because that's what a good teacher does. The more brilliant the student, the more you're going to challenge them. And just be a little, a little quieter perhaps when it's someone like Xenophon who's in front of you. So mm. I think you know the problem of Socrates might just be you know, he was a good teacher, and maybe that's that was really such interesting. a problem. Yeah. So uh, I guess one of the other questions that arises both in Xenophon mm. and in Plato mm. is that, I mean, as annoying as he might be presented mm. as being, mm. he's also being held up as admirable. Yes. And yes. for me, one of the questions about mm. the way Plato uses Socrates is whether he in some sense is being held up to us as someone to imitate. So mm. is he a moral exemplar? Yeah. Or is he almost some sui generis kind of person who yeah. you could never be like. Yeah. And so he was a kind of supernatural phenomenon even. Yes. He has this divine sign, for yes. example. Yes, indeed. And then we wouldn't be supposed to imitate him. And mm. it seems to me that there's maybe a tension in Plato. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, in fact, I think I'd probably move towards the, the latter, that he's, he's sui generis. He's often, he's often described, I mean, he sometimes describes himself this way, and certainly he's described by others as, to use the Greek word, atopos, which means in English something like strange or peculiar. Literally, it means somebody who doesn't have a place. And I think it's... I think he is being portrayed as somebody who's more than merely human, um, doesn't really belong on this earth, but isn't isn't quite divine either. I mean, he has too many flaws to be a to be a god, and I think we're I think we're supposed to think there's a famous. I mean, the ending of the Phaedo, which is Plato's dialogue describing the death of Socrates, right at the end of the Phaedo, um, he's praised by those present as the the best man of his time and I'm sure Plato thought that but I also think he was a sort of a deeply flawed character as as well and strange enough that we're not really supposed to imitate him. So why would you say he's flawed is it partially because of what you mentioned before that when he actually confronts people they don't ever get anywhere, so they don't find out what they're supposed to be looking for? I I think partly that, I think, again, it's hard, and I'm sure this is deliberate on Plato's part. I think it's a a mistake that I think interpreters still often make, which is to say, oh, those stupid interlocutors, how could they have been so stupid as to get into such a muddle? And, and, And it's almost sort of, Poor old Socrates having to deal with these guys. Well, not not really. These guys these guys are okay. I want to say they're not they're not stupid. They're being confronted by the sharpest intellect of their day, usually without warning. <laughs> and I think that their annoyance is supposed to be um, transmitted to us as something that one would almost be bound to feel. We should feel annoyed on we your behalf. We should feel annoyed. I mean, you know, we have the great benefit, exactly. We have the great benefit of being at several times removed from their encounters. Firstly, we're reading a written encounter. Secondly, we're, you know, two and a half thousand years on, and we sort of, we sort of know who Socrates is. And I think, you know, we're being invited to consider this warts and all um, portrayal yes and if you were a greek reader Mm. maybe part of the effect that the dialogue should have on you the first time you read it Mm. is that when the interlocutor says well here's what i think piety is or whatever you think yeah "Yeah, that sounds right exactly and then socrates crushes the definition exactly now now i think the genius of i mean just to talk about plato in a way rather than socrates but the genius of plato is to get us engaged but precisely because of that critical distance so in other words it's a it's an amazing thing he does I think he he both makes us 
feel sympathy for the interlocutor, as we should, I think. And at the same time, that little bit of distance means that we can properly engage. We can be sort of outraged by Socrates, but not in such a way that we want to sort of run away, <laughs> which a lot of the interlocutors do as soon as they can, but to respond and to engage. And I think that's what Plato wants us to do. And I think that's what Socrates wanted to do but actually is portrayed as not being that successful at doing it. I don't think, again, the, the famous fair-minded reader, I don't think honestly thinks that when one of these typical interlocutors goes away, they're going to start examining themselves and being self-critical. And I, I think in that regard, there's, there's some serious failure that, we're, um, that Plato shows us as well. And what about other dimensions of mm. Socrates' character? So mm. it's not mm. just that he questions people. There are other salient features of this guy. So, for example, he's poor. Yes. He goes around barefoot. Yes. And so yes, on and so forth. Yes, he's a yes. very distinctive guy, yeah. both in Aristophanes and Xenophon, and some of these features are picked up in Plato. Yes. Do you think that Plato is encouraging us to imitate Socrates at that level, the way maybe philosophers I, like the Cynics did later on? Mm. I, I, I suspect, I think two, maybe two separate things here. I, I, I think probably, probably not, actually. I think there's a, there's a sort of separate question about what these very distinctive traits are supposed to mean. I think just to, to add a couple of others, he seemed to be remarkably resilient. He's portrayed in the symposium as being able to withstand extremes of heat and cold and to outdrink everybody else at the party without getting always drunk. a useful so, skill. Always a useful skill to have in these situations. But um, I think one thing that I this is a little sort of hobby horse of mine, so I'll I'll I'll, I'll get it in while I can. Um, people, I think this is part of scholars' attempts to sort of sanitize and indeed sanctify Socrates. I think that aspect of him, the poverty, the 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 sort of resilience. He, that people end up often portraying him as a kind of ascetic figure, as somebody who's turned away from the physical world, who has a sort of commitment to not engaging with it. And I think that's, that's a mistake. I mean, I think Socrates is a much more earthy character than that. And, and you know, to, to, to give but a couple of examples, you know, he's, he's married, he has children. He has, he's 70 when he's on trial and he has a young son. So he's, this, is, this is a man who's not, you know, unlike I suspect Plato, <laughs> incidentally, I think Plato's probably the ascetic, but we can't, can't really tell. But unlike Plato, Socrates as portrayed is certainly not somebody who withdraws from the physical world. I think he's somebody who couldn't care less about it one way or the other. You know, he goes to the symposium, he has dinner, he drinks and you can't say about him until he's drunk. He drinks until anybody else would be drunk. Um, this is somebody who's perfectly happy to um, indulge in physical pleasures. I think the crucial thing about Socrates and where he's probably genuinely, was genuinely different from a lot of his contemporaries is he didn't place any particular value on these activities. He's a human being, so he does what human beings do. He eats and drinks. He doesn't have any sort of ideological fetish about not, about abstention. He's not an abstainer but he's somebody who manages perfectly well or would manage perfectly well without any of this stuff. Uh, so again, I think he's an earthy figure and he's more, he's both earthy and, and ironically all the more unworldly because he lives with all this stuff, but at the same time he's indifferent to it. And in fact, if he thinks that what's really valuable in mm. life is virtue and knowledge, yes. which may or not, may or not be the I, same thing. Right, we'll that <laughs> discuss. Uh, <laughs> then he might think that it was just as much a mistake to value, for Good. example, hunger Good. or avoiding food exactly. as to value food. Exactly. And the same thing with I think drinking it, exactly. and sex that, and that, Exactly. That would be somebody who, um, by that very attitude, was putting far too much emphasis on the physical, where Socrates thinks, no, it doesn't matter one way or the other. Um, I, you, you might say it's a dangerous attitude. I mean, perhaps, again, one of the, and I'm not sure about this, to be honest, but I think, you know, it, it it's, there's a, I must recount, there's a famous, wonderful story in the um, symposium where Alcibiades, um, one of both, I think, one of Socrates' great loves and, 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 and also Socrates, one of Alcibiades' great loves, I think there's a, 
there's a there's a real sort of mutual love affair there of particularly peculiar kind it being Socrates but um, Alcibiades in the symposium tells the story of how he attempted to seduce Socrates he got Socrates into bed and Socrates just lay there all night and uh, didn't Alcibiades being the most handsome charming man of his of his age uh, and nothing happened now it seems to me that an ascetic doesn't get into bed literally <laughs> with Alcibiades. Somebody like Socrates, who is indifferent, gets into bed, doesn't feel like sex, doesn't have sex, but he's not he's not living in a cave, avoiding all such temptation. He's putting himself right in right in harm's way. Um, and his uniqueness is that he can, you know, he can resist it without without really any effort. It's not it's not it's not a sort of quasi Christian you know, effortful resisting of temptation. He doesn't put much value on it in the end, and so it's easy for him to lie next to Alcibiades and nothing happens. Alcibiades hates it, but that's another story. <laughs> that's what you get when you're dating Socrates. <laughs> yes, you have been warned. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing that he does value, of course, yes. is virtue. Yes. He's always trying to find out what mm. virtue is, both in general, as for example in mm. the Mino, mm. and the particular virtues, so justice, yes. piety, courage, and so yes. on. And he seems to think that virtue is or has a lot to do with knowledge. Yeah. Do you think he's making yeah. the stronger version of the claim that virtue is just the same thing as knowledge? Do you yeah. think he's, as it were, consistent mm. across Plato's dialogues in holding that? I suspect that he does think that. I think he certainly, let, I mean, deal with the fir first thing first. I think he certainly thinks that knowledge is necessary for virtue that if you don't know what virtue is you can't be virtuous or at least which i think comes to the same thing you can't be reliably virtuous so is that the yeah. knowledge that's relevant is it because you mm. said knowing what the virtue is yeah as opposed that's because right. you might think well yeah. okay courage is knowing what to do in a battle yes but that's different from knowing what courage is right and he seems to have a i i, I would say that he does seem to have a fairly one might say intellectualized view of what knowledge is and he says i mean there's a there's a there's a good example in in the euthyphro i mean he you know sometimes socrates sort of tells us why he thinks what he does more than we give him credit for and there's a there's a there's a bit in the euthyphro where he says look euthyphro tell me what piety is because euthyphro is a bit of a self-appointed expert on the god so socrates thinks aha here's somebody who'll be able to tell me what piety is tell me what piety is and here's how he, he and he explains why he wants to know. He says to 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 to, to Euthyphro, so that I can tell which things are pious and which aren't. So the idea is that without a proper definition of piety, you can't reliably tell what is pious from what is not pious, whether in his own words and deeds or in somebody else's. And I think actually, that's not a that's a pretty tenable view. It's a controversial view by all means, but it's 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 not a it's not a crazy view. Um, I think he's very keen on the idea of getting things reliably right, and that means being reliably able to tell one thing from another. So I almost like yeah. a scientist might have a test for whether a certain substance is that's, present. That's right. They say, you know, put it through the spectrometer, and if you get this result, a then... Absolutely. I mean, it is, there's no question, it is a very intellectualized version of virtue, and I think... I mean, courage is always going to be a good a good one because he, you know, courage we tend to think is sort of all about really all about doing whatever needs to be done at the at the time. But I think I think I mean this is a little bit speculative. I think Socrates would reject the idea that somebody who just happens to end up doing the right thing by let's say a kind of instinct. I mean, knowledge in that sense, you've got a good instinct for what counts as the courageous thing to do. I think he'd say that's not really truly courageous That's because luck. In the, it's kind of luck yeah yeah but even if i believe socrates mm. that knowledge is necessary mm. for virtue yeah it's pretty hard to believe that it's sufficient for virtue right so if i had yeah. this test mm. so i know what courage is mm. and i apply the test mm. i say well this Act, action is courageous, it passes the test. Mm. That's not going to be enough to get me to do the right action, is it? No, this is, this is, this is one of the most controversial areas of, of Socrates, what Socrates seems to advocate, which is that if you know that something is good or right, you will inevitably do it. I think that's something he does think, and I even think that, and I think... <sighs> 
I think if he didn't think that, it would actually be much harder to explain the the sheer emphasis on knowledge. I mean, a mere if it's a mere necessary condition, there are other important conditions as well. You'd think he'd sort of bang on about about them, <laughs> but he doesn't. The fact is, he's always talking about knowledge, and I, I think, I mean, there's there's a particularly famous text, which at the end of the Protagoras, where he argues explicitly I'm going to qualify this in a minute but I'm going to start off by saying because it's Socrates everything has to be qualified eventually um, he, he, he seems at least to be arguing explicitly for the thesis that what's known as acrasia or weakness of will is impossible to put that more positively he's arguing for the thesis that nothing can come between somebody's knowledge of what the right thing to do is and they're doing it for example it's impossible to be waylaid by pleasure so if you think the right thing to do is is go and do some exercise then the pleasure of sitting watching tv isn't going to to um distract you um if you genuinely know that exercise is the best thing to do you're gonna you're gonna do it and he has a very ingenious argument at the end of the protagoras in favor of that thesis. The complication is, I mean, there's several complications, but one is that he seems to base his argument on the idea that hedonism is true. In other words, the idea that what is good is nothing other than pleasure. So the pleasant and the good are one and the same thing. And he, 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 he argues that basically if that's true, then the idea that you could know what's best but do something else because you're as he puts it overcome by pleasure is absurd you'd simply if pleasure just is the good you'd be doing the best thing anyway being overcome by pleasure is just being quote overcome by the good you know although in other words being overcome by what is in fact the best action if you're ahead in this and the, re the reason this is this is complicated is it, it socrates is very rude about pleasure in other places to cut a long story short i mean here here's, here's what i think is the is the sort of gist of this i think he does advocate the controversial thesis that that knowledge is sufficient for right action but i also think that the argument he uses and this is classic socrates is not actually primarily i think this is a really important point is not primarily about him advocating his own point of view or even arguing for his own point of view using premises that he himself believes in i think all the time he's doing what he says in the apology he does which is he's testing people and just to again briefly put that in a bit of context in the protagoras he's arguing against protagoras and what he ends up the upshot of this argument is not simply the conclusion that you can't uh, act against your knowledge of what's best but it's to show Protagoras that his thesis, which is that courage at least, so to take your example, Peter, um, that courage at least is not something that's simply reducible to knowledge, is false. So actually what that argument in the Protagoras serves is to show that Protagoras' own beliefs are confused and that he needs to go away and try and sort out his beliefs and get them in better shape so i think i'm still inclined to say that this is something socrates believes that he wouldn't be banging on about it so much if he didn't believe it but that his primary task is not to advocate a particular point of view but to get the people he's talking to to sort out their, to show them first that their beliefs are confused and therefore that they need to sort them out and hopefully get a, a, a better grasp on these issues themselves. That's what he's about. And so yeah. maybe the mm. that gives us a nice segue mm. into Plato because if Socrates mm. was always concerned with responding to the person in front of him, yes. it would make sense that his great student Plato writes in dialogues is only showing us people confronting each other. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. Um, I mean, I think that th there are, I mean, I think we should give a bit of, a bit of air time to to perhaps the slightly less combative Socrates. I mean, in a dialogue like the Phaedo or the Republic, when he's talking to people who don't have the kind of absurdly misguided pretensions to knowledge that somebody like Euthyphro or maybe even Protagoras has, 
he seems to be firstly less sort of interested in in, in humiliating them and showing them up, <laughs> to, to put it bluntly. And secondly, again, on the surface, more interested in arguing for a particular point of view. Even then, though, I think it's complicated. I mean, the Fido, where he does seem to sort of give us a whole range of arguments about to prove that the soul is immortal, not clear whether he's really <sighs> trying to persuade his interlocutors that that's the case as something that he himself believes so again it's not I mean I think he does believe it but again I think the extraordinary thing about Socrates is that he's he's probably in that sense more concerned with motivating the interlocutors to think that there's something worthwhile about the kind of life that he lives than to really sort of persuade somebody else of something that he himself believes. I think one of the really peculiar things about Socrates is that he's, and this is something that Alcibiades accuses him of, I think rightly, that you never quite know what Socrates himself believes. And I think he's not interested in ultimately and particularly in telling us what he believes. And if there's anything, there's one thing he's really passionately convinced of is simply that we should go on inquiring and exactly. never give up. Exactly, exactly. And in that spirit, mm. I would like to invite our listeners to keep listening next week when I get to the first Plato episode, the first of many Plato episodes. But for now, I'd like to thank you, Rayful, for coming on the podcast and sharing Peter. your wisdom with us. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>